So welcome back to my video uh, series here as far as some basic web terminology that if you are just starting out as a web designer, uh, that you might want to be familiar with. I want to reemphasize, like in the previous video, this is not an end-all be-all type of list. However, we love to throw around acronyms. So I felt that it might be very, very helpful for those who are starting out that if you're reading articles or maybe you're reading a textbook and you see all of these acronyms and you're like, what on earth are people talking about? This could help you a little bit. So from the previous video, I had actually started talking about the Uniform Resource Locator and how also it kind of played into servers. Now again, the servers I consider more of like a web dev side of things. Sometimes as a web designer, you may be doing both, which is something that nowadays we actually call full stack. But one of the things to be considerate of is, okay, so you've made your website, you've designed it out, you hand it off to the devs, how do you actually get it up to the servers? And that brings us to an item or a process that is actually called FTP. So you have what is called FTP, or file transfer protocol. The thing with file transfer protocol is you can do this from anywhere. Yeah, there are certain uh, software packages that can make it a little bit easier as far as uploading is concerned. But on Windows, for instance, even just using the Windows Explorer, you can set up an FTP connection so long as you know the login and password to get onto the server. Then it's just a matter of dragging and dropping your website over to the server. So for instance here, if this box represents, you know, your local computer, we'll say local PC here, and on here, you have a website folder. So what you can do is you can pick up the phone and make an FTP call. So long as you have, again, the username and password, it'll come over to your server. It'll make that connection and then you can take your folder and make a copy on the server. Placed correctly on the server, that's when coming all the way back, that's when that URL can kick in as far as your web address is concerned, and now your website is live. So while you as the web designer may not be asked to actually do FTP, sometimes you can run into it. And for those of you taking classes with me, we will get into that probably in the last few weeks, just so you can see it in action and understand what's going on there. For right now though, just be aware of the FTP process. So that finishes as far as that goes. Now let's come all the way back. So we've kind of talked about controlling our web pages at this point and our websites, like what goes into them uh, as far as FTP, URL, servers, the languages, etc. But where do we actually go as far as making them is concerned. One term you will often hear people throw around is WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get. This kind of stems for web designers. way back in ancient history, and by ancient history, I mean the 2000s, the early 2000s, maybe the late 90s, there was kind of a tug of war as far as web design and development in general. You had the designers who wanted to create the actual layouts, but it was, why do I need to learn how to program or write HTML and CSS as far as markup languages? But vice versa, you also had the programmers sitting there saying, well, I don't want to have to learn how to do graphic design. I just want to program. So for many years now, we've been trying to find this happy medium as far as things go. And as of 2024, when I'm recording this, we're starting to see a real push for what is called full stack. And with full stack developers, the idea is that a full stack can do both front end and back end. So you have full stack there, but it's both the web designer on the front end, but then also the developer on the back end. Again, for this lecture, I'm focusing mainly 
on this side here, the designer. So coming back to WYSIWYGs for web designers, the idea behind this is that these are editors that allow you to actually create layouts but not actually have to write any type of HTML or CSS or even a third language called JavaScript. Now, these come in two formats. They can actually be software that is installed. So for example, uh, one of the ones you're going to see on my YouTube channel is Adobe Dreamweaver. However, a lot now are also available in terms of just being hosted in browser. These include websites such as like Wix.com, uh, you also even, I would say, WordPress.com, not WordPress.org, WordPress.com. I'll actually add that in here to clarify. And also, I'd even say, you know, uh, Weebly, uh, ArtStation for a lot of 3D elements and things like that. So we do actually have a lot of in-browser, kind of removing that need to actually download and be at a computer. The drawback to, I'd say, the in-browsers, though, however, is yes, you have control, but something like a software package like Dreamweaver, from a design standpoint, you have a much stronger workflow for the WYSIWYG. With Adobe acquiring many of the Macromedia products, if we think about it in terms of the Dreamweaver software, like most Adobe products, we have that kind of, you could call it almost beautiful, like if I come down here, whereby I can work between, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, Premiere, and all of my edits can be updated and reflected on the WYSIWYG side of things whenever I'm working in Dreamweaver. That's kind of always been Adobe's selling point here. So that's, to, again, for this topic, we talked about FTP, and really the other item was WYSIWYG. Now, the other item that I'd like to talk about as far as design is concerned is two terms you'll often hear, which is, oops, let me make sure I click on my right layer there, there we go, is user interface, but we'll often put a slash there and say user experience as well. These are actually two very different areas, but quite frequently, unfortunately, funding, et cetera, uh, miscommunication, folks will think that, oh, if somebody can do you know, user interface design, therefore, they can also do work in user experience. This isn't always the case. Is it something that happens? Absolutely. Uh, there is some overlap between the two. However, one thing that you want to consider is really the user interface element here is more about as far as the design, the front facing elements that the user is going to work with, button placement, uh, color choices, font choices, accessibility, etc. User experience, on the other hand, is almost more, while yes, they give design feedback, you're doing a lot more research regarding the target audience for the website. This can include things like focus groups as far as the usability of the site. This can also include uh, usability tests and studies with individuals from that target audience. Uh, honestly, personal opinion and take it or leave it, but I find both of them extremely fascinating. I think because of the researcher side of me, I really like the idea of the user experience. I've done UX in the past. However, I can see how they kind of are almost cylindrical where you create the user interface, you then 
do the research and testing for the user experience, you gather the data, and then you go back and you make updates to the user interface based on the data that was collected in the user experience testing. If anybody is further interested in this, uh, there is a text that I often use in my classrooms. It's called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. Uh, it's, that is S-T-E-V-K-R-U-G. It's a nice short book. Uh, a lot of graphics, honestly, a lot of comics too, serious comics, but very much a really nice kind of definition and display of what is actually involved in the process. So just be aware, people will often talk about UI and or UX, but you may run into people in the industry that say UI, UX, thinking that you are actually going to be doing both simultaneously together. All right, so finally here, this actually brings me into one final piece, uh, not so much tied to anything, but I did want to share it with folks. Uh, it's kind of its own entity here, but for those who are brand new to design here, I wanted to talk about some web graphic file extensions. I previously talked about, you know, .html for HTML documents and .css for cascading style sheets. But as you begin designing your own websites, if you are using Creative Commons type of uh, images, you want to be aware of the type of image that you are downloading and the ramifications that it can have. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, probably the easiest one that to begin with that a lot of us are actually pretty familiar with would be what is called the JPEG or the Joint Photographic Expert Group. Now, I want to also include in this uh, little demo here, normally we've kind of shifted back to .jpeg. However, be aware you may see .jpg as well. This is actually the same exact file type. Uh, there's a long history there, but they're the same. Some of the things with a JPEG that makes it so phenomenal is it is capable of handling millions of colors. So this is often a great choice right out of the gate that people will pick regarding photographs. If anything, if you've ever looked at your phone or tried to download uh, images off of your phone or a point and a uh, snap camera, you may have noticed that the file type is actually a JPEG. That's because these are able to handle millions, on, millions upon millions of colors. But from a web standpoint, what this means is because it can handle the millions here, you run the risk of your file size going up. Back when we still had uh, 56K modems and things like that, this was actually a big issue for us as web designers, was we had to take into consideration how high resolution graphically did we want our websites to be. Sure, you want to have, you know, the most crisp, cleanest files as far as your graphics are concerned. But if somebody on a 56K was waiting, you know, two or three minutes for your website to download, that wasn't a good thing either. So with that, we started in, you know, web design or graphic design software packages such as Photoshop, for example, where this is considered uh, as far as the saving and exporting we were able to kind of start as far as exporting, we could change the quality of the JPEGs. So we could actually choose quality levels, which actually ties into, especially when we get to another one here, uh, we could also compress the graphics as well. So this started getting into compressions. But here is the deal as far as 
compression is concerned. So I compress the graphic once for the web. I come back though and realize, okay, I needed to add to this graphic, we actually need to compress it a little more. So we compress it again. Now it's been compressed twice. The more you compress a JPEG, the more detriment you do to the quality of the graphic there. So this is where, while you may often hear, you know, the terms lossy and lossless, lossy refers to JPEGs, that the more we compress over and over, the more the graphic will deteriorate. Uh, this is where you can often get the pixelation uh, as far as over compression. Some people uh, in the olden days, we used to use the term the jaggies and things like that. So that, that let me take you to the other side now. So we just talked about JPEGs. We also have another graphic file type that hit the scene, which was the PNG or the ping. The ping is a portable network graphic and we actually have two versions of this file that you would see if you were in a graphics program. We have both the 8-bit and the 24-bit. Now, the 8 can handle 256 colors. Think about the world around you. 256 may seem like a lot from a numerical standpoint, but think about if you take a photograph and then try to save it as a PNG 8-bit. You don't have a lot of colors to work with there. However, only having 256 colors, oh, this is great because it makes the file very small, which is why PNG also released a 24 version, which like its counterpart, the JPEG, handles millions of colors. But PNGs are what we call lossless file types. No matter what, it's still going to be larger than a JPEG. However, it can handle multiple re-edits and recompressions, and we don't lose quality of graphic. But you're always going to have that issue that the file size is going to be a little larger. Going back to my point, though, with the JPEG, Back whenever we were dealing with things like 56K modems, and that was like eons ago now, this would have been a much larger problem. Nowadays, for me at least, whenever I'm designing a web page, most of my graphics, even if I'm dealing in a photograph, I'm probably going to go straight to the PNG24. Another thing that a PNG brings to the table that a JPEG does not is a PNG is capable of keeping transparencies. If you've ever seen a graphic, for instance, like let's say if you were working on an artboard in Photoshop and you have the outer artboard here, but instead your logo is circular. When you save as a PNG, you can check a box for transparency. I might be running out of space there, I apologize. So then it removes this portion and you can see through that area and it'll still keep the graphic there. So you wanna pay attention to that with PNGs as well. Now, let me go ahead and just check my space here. Okay, last but by no means least, we have what is called the GIF. The GIF is actually capable of handling small animations. So this is great for little things like on social media or if you've ever seen the internet memes, these are coming from GIFs. If you've also noticed with a lot of those, the quality of the graphic is pretty low and that's because GIFs they actually are only capable of handling 256 colors. 
So it is a big trade-off. You can do animations. It also is a graphic file type that can handle transparencies, but you lose out, you know, it, do, it cannot handle millions of colors like the ping and JPEG can. But likewise, with JPEGs and PNGs, you really don't want to be dealing in animations here. So great for small, cute animations for social media. I rarely, though, from uh, just single photographs or images, I don't see the GIF used too much anymore. Whenever I see people needing to work with either photography or high you know, resolution graphics, they're normally going with JPEG or PNG. So I hope these few lectures here helped folks as far as just getting started with some basic terminology that you may hear. Maybe you watch another YouTube video or you're reading through an article on the web. I hope this helps as far as giving you a little bit more of kind of a crash course on the background and terminology that we use.